we're going to kind of focus on today is the role of rheumatologists in the multidisciplinary care of patients with autoimmune encephalitis. Uh, and kind of thinking, starting with when rheumatologists may be involved. And I think that's challenging, but there's a lot of variability across the country, uh, depending on primarily the availability of neuroimmunologists. Uh, and there are more neuroimmunologists in the adult world than there are in the pediatric world. And I think partly for that reason, uh, pediatric rheumatologists have be, been more involved in the care of children with autoimmune encephalitis and other autoimmune inflammatory brain diseases, uh, really over the past 10 years or so, um, partly in the reflection of uh, that lack of neuroimmunology training in many of our pediatric neurologists. And that is an area that's really growing and exciting, um, but it's allowed us to kind of get into this space. So much of what I'll say today pertains more to pediatric rheumatologists potentially than adult rheumatologists, but I think there's a lot we can learn from this experience. Uh, so common reasons that rheumatologists are involved in care, uh, classically are they're asked to come consult to rule out a rheumatic disease such as neuropsychiatric lupus or things like that. Um, and they are also at times asked to help with decisions around immunosuppressant treatments, um, ongoing management and long-term monitoring for patients. Uh, in particular, in pediatric rheumatology, there are many places in the country where pediatric rheumatologists are asked to take primary ownership of patients with autoimmune encephalitis, and we'll talk about that a little bit more um, here in the next few slides. So uh, we did a survey in 2015 of pediatric rheumatologists asking them what their involvement was in the care of children with autoimmune encephalitis. Um, there were, at the time, about 300 pediatric rheumatologists in North America, so the U.S. and, and Canada, excuse me, that, that portion of North America. Uh, so it was a, a fairly decent response rate. Um, there, uh, of the respondents, 74% responded that they evaluated and treated children with autoimmune encephalitis. And 20% of those who responded stated that their um, institution had, they were the primary service who, who took care of children with autoimmune encephalitis. When we looked at what um, the role was of the different um, uh, pediatric rheumatologists involved in AE care, uh, we found that all of them pretty much were involved in ruling out rheumatic disease. Uh, but over uh, approximately 60% were involved in actually the initial management to help decide if this was an autoimmune encephalitis um, in the first place. Uh, and then, of course, uh, often asked to participate in the di uh, decisions around treatment recommendations. Um, our next question was, was about pediatric rheumatologist comfort and, and challenges in taking care of children with um, autoimmune encephalitis. And we asked of those who felt they had significant challenges um, where they saw those challenges. And 64% or about 60% of the respondents um, had significant challenges in take, uh, caring for children with autoimmune encephalitis. Um, I think you'll be able to see my point in here. The most common issues they had was feeling they did not have adequate training uh, during their fellowship uh, otherwise to treat those children um, and just how sick these children were from both the neurologic and psychiatric um, disease state. There were also significant um, findings in that 40% of pediatric rheumatologists found it was difficult to collaborate with neurologists. And when we dove into this uh, a little bit more, we found this kind of um, spanned um, some pediatric rheumatologists wanting to be more involved but being at an institution where they either had neuro, a robust neuroimmunology program um, where they were not felt to be really needed in the care of children. Um, but more um, significant number of pa uh, pediatric rheumatologists who were being asked to really take on the primary management of these patients and not feeling that they had the skill set to do that um, and the support. Uh, and probably one of the most dramatic examples of that um, was when a pediatric rheumatologist came up to me after a talk and asked how I decide when to taper um, uh, AEDs. And um, I was said, oh, I, I let the neurologist um, decide that, you know, sometimes as we're, we don't taper them at the same time we taper immunotherapy. And she's like, oh no, at my institution, as, so, as soon as it's diagnosed as an autoimmune encephalitis, they sign off on the case and it's only followed by rheumatology. So it really just kind of highlighted the spectrum um, that I've seen across the country in terms of um, the role that pediatric rheumatologists are playing. In the adult rheumatology world, where there are certainly more neuroimmunologists, um, their involvement in uh, the adult rheumatologists that I've spoken to has not been as robust um, as the pediatric rheumatologists. And I think that we have primarily adult uh, neurologists on this call. Um, so you may have a very different experience. Um, but I think it's taught us some really interesting lessons about how um, we need to think about the uh, degree of interest in having um, this collaboration, both from the neurology perspective as well as the rheumatology perspective, and how we can really meet um, in the middle to figure out the times when it really is appropriate for rheumatologists to be involved or when we're really um, just another cook in the kitchen that's not, not really contributing to care. Uh, and so when we think about that, I think 
that um, I think about the timing of, of involving rheumatologists and, and there's a little bit of a Goldilocks um, issue here where if we get called a little too late, um, sometimes that can make it really challenging if we're trying to then figure out if this is a um, primary rheumatic or other autoimmune process. You know, these are classically patients who didn't respond well to initial therapy and people are kind of rethinking what the diagnosis was. And this can make it challenging if patients have already received steroids and IVIG as those um, treatments can alter our ability to do workups um, for some rheumatic diseases. Uh, it's also a challenge for rheumatologists to come in at times when they're only seeing the sickest of patients or the atypical cases to really have a good sense about how to conceptualize um, the these severe forms of uh, an autoimmune encephalitis or other primary neurologic entity versus when they should be having red flags for more of a primary rheumatic or potential rheumatic disease. Um, likewise, the co conflict of consulting us too early is that um, we may be getting consulted on a bunch of patients where we don't really contribute anything. Um, they have a more straightforward um, neuro uh, immunology diagnosis, um, and that may result in unnecessary testing in some cases. Uh, and so I think trying to find that just right is challenging. And again, we'll circle back to this theme of the, your local institution and colleagues around you helping um, figure out what that um, collaboration should look like. And in uh, my experience, both working um, here at Duke and, and kind of developing this collaborative model, which I've been really blessed to have fantastic colleagues in neurology and psychiatry that were willing to go on this journey with us, um, is really evaluating the experience and the confidence of your providers, both on your neurology colleagues and their comfort with neuroimmunology, as well as your rheumatology colleagues and their comfort with neurology or neuroinflammatory diseases, and figuring out where the strengths and weaknesses of each other are and where you have potential to collaborate. And in that process, you're also able to figure out the ability um, or the availability and willingness of each other to collaborate. Really, where are the, the lines that we feel in our institution we really have figured out and where is there the potential for that overlap and collaboration? And then I think also working on figuring out kind of some um, red flag kind of things in terms of things that you want if neurology is going to be the primary service evaluating, which it is in most places, including my institution. What are some things that you want um, those residents or fellows or, or providers to be thinking about when they're doing their standard history to kind of layer in when they're thinking about a neuroinflammatory or neuro um, autoimmune process? That could be reasons that you would think about consulting uh, rheumatology earlier rather than later in the course. And sometimes even having a few screening um, rheumatology labs that uh, don't add a ton of cost to the care, um, so it really just as a screening tool to help you decide um, when it's uh, worthwhile to engage, or, uh, engage a rheumatologist at that stage or not. Um, there are, it's a pretty broad differential of rheumatic diseases that can cause um, pretty acute onset neuropsychiatric symptoms that can look a lot like an autoimmune encephalitis. Um, neuropsychiatric lupus is certainly the most common um, encountered entity that uh, both rheumatologists are seeking neurologist support for and, and neurologists may question, um, especially in young women, uh, de developing new onset psychiatric or neurologic symptoms. Um, but we have a broad spectrum of uh, vasculitides that can do this, including primary CNS vasculitis, um, especially the small vessel or angiographic uh, negative vasculitis that can look very much like an autoimmune encephalitis with pretty diffuse manifestations. Um, and then we have uh, the dreaded neurobrachets and neurosarcoid, and I call them dreaded because they can be very challenging to diagnose at times, particularly when patients are presenting initially with neurologic manifestations of these conditions. And though the official diagnosis for both neurobrachets and neurosarcoids depends on systemic manifestations that would support the primary diagnosis of brachets or sarcoid, we do have significant data that shows some patients will present initially with those neurologic manifestations, um, and they may evolve over time. And we certainly had a case of that in our institution with a young man who presented um, uh, encephalopathic um, with seizures and um, uh, MRI changes. Uh, he um, eventually went on to get a brain biopsy um, that was concerning for vasculitis. Uh, and um, as his dad was tapering the steroids because he didn't like his son on steroids, he developed oral and um, uh, genital ulcers, classic of uh, uh, Bichette's had a biopsy of the skin lesions that confirmed that diagnosis. Um, but that was only after about five months after his initial presentation with recurrent um, neurologic uh, disease. So uh, those cases can be really challenging and, and definitely worthy of some collaborative effort. Uh, and then antifastolipid syndrome uh, can cause certain encephalopathy, um, often uh, movement disorders such as chorea can be seen in that group too. 
So just having some of these conditions in the back of your mind, if you're a neurologist, to kind of um, think about signs of systemic inflammation, thinking about rashes, um, the, the classic joint pain and things like that, of course, but other organ involvement that would kind of point you toward um, wanting to engage a rheumatologist earlier in the course. And then really where we spend a lot of our time um, in, is in the treatments. So many rheumatologists will sign off after this stage. Uh, they've gone through the initial evaluation. They do not think this is a rheumatic disease and they, they sign off at that point, um, which is great. Um, uh, others are gonna be um, continue to be involved or will not be primarily involved until we get to the treatment stages. So even after someone has been diagnosed with primary autoimmune encephalitis, um, rheumatologists are often brought in to help with um, deciding about escalation of um, immunotherapy primarily. Um, there are times when we're asked to consult about IVIG or steroids, <clears throat> and our neurologists are really thoughtful about um, recognizing the fact that once they give those medications, it can alter our workup. So sometimes it's just a curbside and sometimes it's official um, uh, consult, and other times they feel confident with what the disease is and they, they move forward with those first line therapies, which is great. Um, but really kind of um, having a, a, a plan in place it, it, as best you can at your institution about when medications are going to be initiated. And then um, there's some significant back and forth sometimes at our institution about kind of when to escalate and how to decide to escalate. And that, that's a dance that we've done over the years and we really have a good system in place now. Um, but it, it's not always um, easy and neat when you're first developing these collaborations. And so I think um, having that open communication, direct communication is really helpful. Um, there are some differences in, in the kind of understanding of, of timing of when, um, when, after you started a disease modifying agent, um, when you should expect it to start working and when you would say it's failed. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit as we go through some of these specific medications. Um, and then also some uh, opportunities for discussions around escalation of medication. So when we're thinking about the treatment of autoimmune encephalitis, I think we wanna be thinking about, you know, what our targets of immunotherapy are. Um, and I think of them in three broad categories. Um, we're trying to remove the antibody. We do that through plasma exchange, um, which directly removes antibodies, as well as IVIG. And I think there was a question in um, Dr. Najar's talk about all the different ways that IVIG works. Um, and there are, you know, over a dozen different mechanisms that are thought to um, explain in part how IVIG helps decrease inflammation, um, in particular for antibody-mediated diseases. Um, but one mechanism is increasing the clearance of, of antibodies, in particular autoantibodies. Um, we also are trying to stop the production of antibodies, um, autoantibodies in particular, um, and this is where we have the more targeted B cell therapies and, and newer plasma cell therapies. Um, but steroids work on really all um, parts of the immune system and, and decrease that inflammatory response and, and cell proliferation um, and the inflammatory response to it. Um, and then we're going to talk more about these particular um, medications as, as we kind of go through the next few slides. And then the last, which I think is really equally important, is we need to decrease infl the inflammatory response to the antibodies. So we can have local effects, um, complement um, activation, T cell mediated um, injury that can occur um, related to these antibodies. And certain antibodies are more likely to trigger that complement activated and T cell activated immunity that can be more destructive, um, where other antibodies such as NMDA um, may work more by the involution of the receptors and um, there may be less destruction, um, which may in part explain why some patients can have such dramatic recoveries with some forms of autoimmune encephalitis, um, even when they're severely ill, um, compared to others that tend to be a little more refractory to, to immunotherapy. And those are really um, helpful things to think about, um, what that antibody is, what type of immune response you have to that antibody when it's known, it's not always known, um, to help you think about which um, medications you wanna use, which part of the immune system you wanna target, and the urgency of escalation. Um, I think those things come into play when we're, when we're thinking about that. So I think as Dr. Pittick said, like NMO, pretty destructive antibody in many cases, GAD antibodies, um, in GAD associated diseases can be um, a more destructive antibody where you may have less reversibility and may want to treat more aggressively really right out of the gate. Um, so pretty much all of the medications are gonna work on decreasing that inflammatory response to some degree. Um, steroids certainly do in, in decreasing um, complement activation and um, recruitment of other cells. Uh, IVIG has numerous anti-inflammatory effects. It inhibits complement, the complement cascade. It stimulates regulatory T cells, which I think Dr. Najar mentioned earlier on um, in his talk. Uh, it neutralizes autoantibodies. Um, I think someone had asked a question about um, 
when you give IVIG, does it have anti antineuronal antibodies uh, effects? There are neutralizing um, effects to autoantibodies that have to do with um, uh, the variable regions. So, um, anti idiotypic antibodies um, that help clear those autoantibodies, uh, even if they're not directly against NDA or, or a particular um, target uh, per se. Uh, and then they reduce some of the cytokines that are involved in inflammation. So, uh, you know, IVIG, there's a reason everybody loves it. It works in lots of different ways and mechanisms to, to decrease the immune response. Um, and then some of our more targeted um, anti-cytokine therapies like IL-6 inhibition with tocilizumab, um, as well as a myfortic, um, uh, or sorry, glyphenolic acid, which has um, significant effects both on cell-based immune responses as well as cytokine production. So I thought we'd spend just a few, one slide, um, looking at the immune system. Um, hopefully you'll all remember this from your med school days. Um, I'm sure in very detailed um, uh, memory, um, but in terms of your B cell lineage and um, the stimulation of B cells by antigens and then this um, necessary um, co-stimulation by T cells to really activate B cells um, to start producing antibodies. And those um, activated B cells can go on to become short-lived plasma cells. Um, and these still have um, CD20 expressed on them, which we'll talk about when we talk about rituximab. Um, but I assume many of you are familiar with rituximab use in autoimmune encephalitis. And so um, it can target short-lived plasma cells. They have not lost their CD20 markers. Um, and similarly can target plasma the blast. Um, so as you're going through this differentiation into these different antibody producing cells, and these little ones here with these antibodies, these little Y-shaped antibodies are all antibody producing cells. Um, the rituximab can work against your activated B cells. It can work against short-lived plasma cells, and it works against plasma blasts. This is similar to most of the other um, immunosuppressant medicines that we think about um, that really are working on cell division. And so these cells are actively dividing. And that's unlike plasma cells, the long-lived plasma cells. So those have lost their CD20 and um, CD19, and they have um, uh, stopped dividing. And so these cells are not susceptible to things like cytoxin, to rituximab, to many of our medications that really target cell division um, and replication. And so um, this is where some of the newer agents that um, proteasome inhibitors are really being helpful. And we'll talk about those at the end. Um, so when we're thinking about um, how the um, antibody kind of production cycle works from initial B cells through plasma cells, we um, recognize that the effect of the medications that we're using, um, some will work quickly and some will not work quickly, depending on which part of that immune response we're, we're trying to target. So if we're um, targeting uh, removal of antibody with something like plasmapheresis, you may see some variable response. Um, one of the challenges with plasma um, exchange or plasmapheresis is you're not um, decreasing necessarily antibody production, you're just removing it. And so um, if you haven't removed the trigger that's um, kind of pro producing that ongoing antibody production, um, you may not necessarily have a dramatic impact on the disease. And so this is where we find, and I think pretty much most people do this, you wanna be doing uh, plasma exchange and then in addition to, to steroids, IVIG or other things that you're hoping are going to be decreasing that ongoing antibody production. Um, steroids and IVIG tend to work fairly quickly if you're going to see a response to them. Um, not everyone has a response that you'll see, um, but uh, many patients can have almost a near immediate response with IVIG for a variety of, of immune mediated conditions. Um, certainly, autoimmune encephalitis um, is a much more variable response with some people having a, a fairly quick response within a couple of weeks, noticing um, notable improvement. Um, it may not be full recovery by any means. It, pretty much never is, um, but you may say, okay, yeah, I feel like my steroids and IVIG are, are moving the needle or improving. Um, and there is evidence that giving these kind of stacked monthly doses that you'll see that ongoing improvement and, and that's all that some patients require. Certainly for NMDA encephalitis, many people are using rituximab. There's ongoing debate right now about if that should be used out of the gate for all patients with NMDA encephalitis or only in those who are not showing uh, a robust, I like to use that term, robust response to um, their first line immunotherapy with either plasma and IVIG and or steroids. Rituximab works by depleting those B cells. Um, and so as we talked about, it's going to be depleting the B cells, your plasma blasts, um, and your short-lived plasma cells but it's not affecting your long-lived plasma cells that are really the big antibody producers for um, um, many of patients with autoimmune diseases. And so um, 
depending on there's some um, at least some theories about um, treating early and aggressively that you may be able to get to that plasma blast stage before true plasma cells have been produced. Um, there's other uh, situations where it seems to not re really be time dependent. And I think that's part of that immune response we don't have a great understanding of. Um, and so I think that in part explains some of our fast responders to rituximab and our slow responders um, to rituximab. We've seen some patients who will start to improve within two to four weeks. But the usual expected time to see improvement after rituximab is usually four to eight weeks. And that is the case in, in most rheumatic diseases as well. When we're looking at antibody-mediated diseases, such as ankyovasculitis, anch when we're using it, various components for, for lupus. Uh, and so um, I think that's one area where there's often been questions or um, calls that I receive from outside institutions where they will say, well, we just, we gave rituximab and we're not seeing any improvement. And I'll say, well, how long ago did you give rituximab? Well, we gave it three weeks ago and we're not seeing any improvement yet. And, and we would say that's pretty early to see improvement. And we wouldn't say that the rituximab has failed, that they are rituximab, um, have failed to respond to rituximab. We would say that we haven't really given it enough time. Now, certainly when patients are really sick, sometimes we need to think about layering um, medications on. But in general, my perspective and, and those of my rheumatology colleagues I've spoken with is if we're going to give a medication, especially with Oxymab, which has definitely its fair share of potential side effects, we want to give it a chance to work um, before we kind of escalate to other therapies. It also makes it difficult to know if you layer in an, another therapy. Um, four weeks into your dose of rituximab, was it the delayed effect of the rituximab starting to work, or is it really the, the other medication that you used, um, which complicates then how you deserve, decide about long-term management. Um, in general, if we're not seeing any improvement in the three to four month window after rituximab, then we would consider adding other agents. And I think in really sick patients in that two to three month window and um, other patients in the three to four month window. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about this. There's um, no hard science or really trials to help us um, decide this. Um, as someone had mentioned in a previous um, question, we can certainly see an uptick in symptoms as you approach your next dose uh, of any of these medications um, uh, that can just show that there is an ongoing self-perpetuating autoimmune process that we haven't really um, uh, aborted at that point. And that is an indicator in, 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 our, mind, in our mind as a rheumatologist that there's an ongoing process that's going to need um, either a prolonged treatment to try to, over time, uh, impact this process, or that you're really going to need to escalate immunotherapy because you really haven't um, gotten to the, the heart of what's driving this process. Uh, other kind of just time to respond things, because I think this does come up a lot. Um, again, almost all the medications outside of IVIG, steroids, and plasma exchange are going to take time to work. And while patients may not respond to those first line therapies, um, when they do, you can sometimes see a pretty quick response. Um, but most of these other medications are really going to be on the order of weeks to months. Um, cyclophosphamide, the uh, general onset of uh, seeing real improvement is one to two months. You will see depletion of your white cells very quickly, but the downstream effect that the cytoxin has on altering immune cells and altering antibody production takes more time than that. And so it's usually not a direct correlation with when you need or your white count with when you start to see improvement. Uh, uh, MMF, um, uh, it's kind of disrupting cell division again. Um, and so that is gonna be a, a little bit longer time. Usually again, we're seeing something in the one to two months uh, of start that we're gonna start to see improvement. Uh, I'm sorry, and then tocilizumab, um, an IL-6 inhibitor, it's a cytokine inhibitor, and this has a potential for a little faster onset because it's not only working on the immune cells directly and decreasing replication and, and um, recruitment into inflamed tissues, um, uh, but it also has some direct effects on the cytokine um, uh, effects on cells and, and driving antibody production that can work a little quicker in some patients. Um, and so we have noticed in our practice that we will sometimes see improvement within two weeks of starting this medication. And it's very common that we're seeing improvement by four weeks in patients who are going to respond. And I think similar to what the published data is, we found in our experience that if patients haven't shown an improvement by three months, it's unlikely that they're going to, and we haven't continued it after that point. Um, when we look at monitoring, um, with rituximab, which is the most commonly used, so I thought we spent a little bit more time on this one, um, we do follow um, CD19 or CD20 counts. We do it starting around four to five months after dosing because there are um, patients, and this may be more relevant in pediatrics, um, we have noticed in our practice that younger children tend to repopulate earlier. But there's also evidence that um, people with a higher body surface area um, often have um, 
uh, earlier with population two that maybe a dosing effect. Uh, and so we start checking that around four to five months so that we can determine if patients um, are repopulating early. People can repopulate anywhere between they never deplete, which most almost everyone does deplete, but there are a few patients who don't, um, really up to years after rituximab dosing before they repopulate. But most patients will start to repopulate by a year. And in our experience, most starting by six months, or starting around six to nine months, um, we'll start to see some degree of repopulation. And so um, many people are doing the regular six month dosing now. I think this was described in ankylvasculitis, also a common protocol in um, neuromyelitis optica. Um, and so we have that practice um, in our group as well, um, but there are no trials or randomized controlled trials to tell us, um, first of all, when to initiate rituximab, let alone the monitoring um, and maintenance dosing of it for long-term use. Um, so what we do use this as a way to help us um, think about uh, when to redose patients if they need it sooner than six months. The other um, uh, available tests now are anti-rituximab antibodies. So if you have patients who are repopulating really early, um, it's helpful to think about getting those um, because if they have anti-rituximab antibodies, they will clear the rituximab more quickly and it will likely not be as efficacious. And it may be um, the time to think about adding or switching to a different, a different agent. And then the last thing we think about is secondary hypogammaglobinemia um, due to rituximab. Um, and many of our patients are on concurrent IVIG and rituximab earlier in their course with tapering off IVIG. And so we do follow immunoglobulins on patients, um, usually starting three to four months after, um, just for the infection risk associated with that. And the other kind of thing I'm monitoring, um, in addition to the standard blood counts and other things that we do, um, for, for MMF, um, you can get levels of MMF. Um, there are no therapeutic defined levels for autoimmune encephalitis for really many, most autoimmune diseases, but it can be a way to look and see if patients um, are adhering to the medication well. I um, mean, there are some um, things like calcium that can inhibit um, absorption of MMF and you can get a sense of how you're doing on your dosing. Um, in, in general terms. Um, we have a lot of teenagers in our group, so we follow just to see if they're taking or not. Um, but the utility of that, I'll, I'll leave to you all. Um, and then just in the last couple of minutes, we'll talk just a little bit about refractory disease. Um, and this is what I'm defining as uh, not responding to second line therapy, which is um, rituximab and or cytoxin. Um, it should be noted, I think there are a few pediatric neurologists um, that had registered um, that some pediat pediatricians, both rheumatologists and I think neurologists, um, are sometimes leaning toward um, earlier teslizumab as opposed to cytoxin, just because the toxicity of it is much less. Um, and we have noticed um, uh, some increased um, or faster onset of action. Uh, and so many pediatric rheumatologists are not using cytoxin. Um, there's been a couple of surveys, both in the US and Europe that have demonstrated that pediatric providers, both neurologists and rheumatologists are less likely to prescribe cytoxin. Um, more likely to use rituximab primarily than our adult colleagues. Um, so tocilizumab is an IL-6 inhibitor, so it's blocking a cytokine. Um, and the, there's um, some, several articles about using it in autoimmune encephalitis. Um, I just provided the standard dosing. Uh, it's usually given every four weeks um, in critically ill patients. Um, the rheumatologic data where this is used in arthritis <clears throat> and some um, autoinflammatory conditions um, it can be used every two weeks and up to 12 milligrams per kilogram safely. And so we um, sometimes do use that more quote unquote rheumatology dosing um, in some patients. Uh, Tofacitinib has just recently been reported. Um, this is a new favorite. I think there's a couple of rheumatologists on the call. So many of us are really enjoying having an oral um, biologic available. Uh, it's working in, in numerous conditions. Um, and primary um, functions by blocking um, cytokine pathways for activating inflammatory processes. Uh, more to come on this, but this is just the, the first paper that I saw that came out recently looking at it in autoimmune encephalitis. And in the last minute, we'll spend just talking a little bit about um, fortizomib. Um, uh, so this is a, a proteasome inhibitor that will help or, or works on um, plasma cells. Um, so it does not depend on cell division um, and uh, is initially used in multiple myeloma. Um, and now is being used more in autoimmune diseases, including lupus. Uh, and the dosing has been adjusted a little bit. So this can be pretty toxic because um, you're, you're basically killing plasma cells. So you're gonna lose those antibodies that you have, those protective antibodies to vaccines and past infections. Um, and so patients who are on this, it is recommended that they be on prophylaxis for PCP or PJPs, sorry, and um, HSV when they're on this medication. 
because um, you're going to lose your, your good antibodies along with your bad antibodies. Uh, initial dosing was IV. Um, there seems to be less toxicity um, in terms of infection risks than others um, with the subcutaneous dosing. And I've seen two different reports of subcutaneous dosing. Um, and it's given every three days for four doses and then a 10 day pause. And that's repeated in 21 day cycles. Um, and people will get somewhere between five to seven cycles is what's reported. Um, and while it works very well for decreasing um, uh, plasma cells uh, and decreasing antibodies, uh, you can detect um, true decreases in antibody levels. Um, the problem with it is that it's short-lived um, and these cells will start to regenerate um, within 10 days of stopping um, the protein cell inhibitors. And so um, this is a, a good uh, initial therapy to you know, bring down antibody uh, production, but it shows that, that we're still going to need um, combination therapy, most likely, and, and people are still working out what that combination therapy looks like. I know CELCEPT has been um, discussed in this paper here, looking at it in lupus, so starting with bortezomab to decrease antibody production and layering in CELCEPT um, as kind of more of your maintenance medicine to try to prevent um, that, that resurgence of uh, B cell activation and plasma cell production. Um, so in conclusion, um, not everyone needs a rotologist, but some do, and kind of figuring out within your institution um, kind of what lanes people want and like to live in and really where you need to meet in the middle, um, I think is really helpful. And to do that before you're at a crisis with a sick patient, um, I think is very helpful. Um, and so starting those discussions with a rheumatologist who may be interested in the brain or a neurologist who may be interested in autoimmune disease and, and developing those partnerships, I think um, can be really rewarding. It's definitely the most rewarding part of, of my um, job, the ability to work with people in, in other fields um, really closely. It's, uh, I learn a ton, it's, it's really fun, and I think we provide better care when we do it. Um, uh, consider rheumatic diseases on your differential and really be thoughtful about when to consult rheumatologists um, depending on level of suspicion because uh, trying to diagnose these things when their patients are partially treated makes it a lot more difficult. Um, and then thinking about really what parts of the immune system we're targeting. Um, we have to respect that the immune system is a complicated um, system and uh, nothing's usually as easy as we think it should be or want it to be. Um, and so uh, needing to escalate to different therapies, being thoughtful about which parts of the immune system we're targeting um, and um, the potential for needing um, uh, multi-drug treatments, um, I think is really important. Um, and then with that, I'll take any questions.